Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the State and Local Tax Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Kyle Brain, and I am a State and Local Tax Attorney with Fredrickson Environment in Minneapolis, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. As we discussed last week, we at Fredrickson have been working with the Society of Minnesota CPAs to put together this four-part webinar series and are continuing to explore whether a form of this will make sense to continue once things get back to some semblance of normality. Before we begin, there are a few technical issues of importance. First, this webinar is taking place using Zoom video conferencing technology. While our presenter's audio is turned on, for obvious reasons, all of your audio is muted. However, although your audio is muted, Zoom does have commentary capabilities. There is a chat button at the bottom of your screen, which I encourage any of you with questions to utilize throughout today's session. The questions will only be shared with the presenter group, so there's little risk of embarrassing yourself in front of your peers. Uh, please don't be shy with any questions. If there are questions we are unable to address during the session today, we may opt to send an email following the session with those answers. Obviously, we are operating in extremely flexible times, so please understand that complete certainty in responding to several questions is, is extremely difficult to achieve. I should also point out that the slides from today's presentation are available for download from the Fredrickson and the Minnesota CPA registration sites. But if you should have any issues, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, my name is Kyle Brame and my contact info is published throughout your registration materials. This session is eligible for CPE credit and CLE accreditation is pending in both Minnesota and Iowa. In order to earn CPE credit, you must respond to the polling questions taking place throughout this session. The reconciliation of those responses and submission for individual CPE credits will be completed around April 27th. I would like to again take a moment to thank the Society of Minnesota CPAs for their partnership in offering this webinar series. Further, I would like to thank all of you, our attendees, for taking the time out of your day to join us. Finally, I'd like to thank and introduce my colleagues, Lynn Linne and Howard Roston, for taking the time to put together and present today's topic, which is navigating property taxes in a COVID-19 market. Both Lynn and Howard are attorneys at Fredericksville and Byron and have assisted a multitude of clients in navigating the challenges associated with property tax controversy, both prior to and now moving through the unique times we are faced with today. With that, I will turn you over to Lynn Lene, and we'll talk to all of you again during our first polling question. Lynn? Thanks, Kyle. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm an attorney at Fredrickson and Byron. Uh, before that, I practiced at the law clerk, as a law clerk at the Minnesota Tax Court. I went to college at Gustavus and attended William Mitchell. Um, and the fun thing about me is that I uh, grew up playing hockey. I played hockey throughout college and I still play with a group of girls that, um, from college today. Howard? Thanks. So my name is Howard Roston. I'm an attorney at Fredrickson um, as well. I've got a, a pretty broad real estate related practice that includes real estate tax uh, uh, protest. Uh, I did not know we were doing fun things about about me, but as long as Lynn did that, I've been taking the I've been taking the downtime during COVID to work on trying to be a famous rock star. It is not going well, so I think I'll stick with real estate law um, instead. So, go ahead, Lynn. All right, let's get started. Oh, so you're you're controlling the slides, right, Lynn? I'm trying. <laughs> uh, here. Sorry, folks, we had this working just a minute ago. It's just. Well, while Lynn's um, working on the slides, and I'll stop when Lynn gets the slides, I can tell you that um, as part of my practice, um, I've been doing a lot of consulting with mostly uh, property owners and landlords in connection with this COVID world, and I'm learning firsthand what's going on with with tenants, both as my role as a lawyer and I have the uh, also unfortunate situation of being an investor in some real estate. So I'm learning the financial impacts of this very in a very direct uh, and meaningful way. So um, I feel like uh, we're all still navigating this COVID world uh, very clearly, trying to figure out what its impact is on real estate values. But I, I think it's very fair to say there's going to be a pretty significant impact for those of you who are around in the 2008, 9, and 10 time frame. I think it's going to be similar to that, and even maybe more severe. Got control yet, Lynn? 
Hey, Kyle, can you just start going to the next screen? So um, Lynn and I have presented at this seminar before. Um, I always start with the Beatles slide because they tell us we should put something that interests people. And it also shows my age. Um, so what we're talking about here is uh, real estate taxes. And then uh, I lead it off with the Beatles song. And, and uh, we probably all know the song. But if you don't, you're too young. And we can move on to the next slide. So learning outcomes. Today, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about what we're currently seeing in the market, uh, largely as a result of COVID-19. Um, we'll give a brief overview as to what property is subject to tax and common valuation methods and how those may be impacted by COVID-19. Um, we'll also give a very brief overview of the appeals process um, across the Midwest if we have time. If not, we can do an abbreviated version with Minnesota and any COVID-19 related changes as some of the deadlines and process has been changed um, to help give taxpayers more time. All right, polling question one. Okay, I'm going to wrap up polling here. Share the results so we can see that obviously we have a very heavy industry corporate crowd um, with us today, but um, also some, some diversity amongst the, the group as well. So we're going to talk um, a little bit about what we've been able to discern in the last 45 or 60 days, maybe longer, of the of the COVID market. And I think we can go on to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I've been consulting with a lot of property owners on what's actually going on in the marketplace. And it shouldn't be a surprise to you as we look at uh, the news articles, what's happening in the in the industry, and it very it does vary by sector, um, and in it's clear from what I've seen and from the default notices I've seen and the clients that I've consulted with that perhaps the biggest hit sector is going to be retail. That shouldn't surprise anybody. Anybody who has food service or tanning salons or um, nail uh, techs or along those lines. The businesses are all either shut down or dramatically reduced and it's having a direct impact on the financial ability of those tenants and ultimately on their ability to pay to pay rent there was an article i think this is maybe two days ago from the um from the new york times that goes into great detail about this neiman marcus is going to probably file um, bankruptcy and then it's having a ripple effect as people aren't paying vendors certainly uh and landlords are getting the pressure as well. Uh, and there's hundreds of these articles out there. We just picked a couple of them. I think the next slide, Lynn. Um, the, the restaurant industry, uh, I think this is a little bit dated. I think from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, it's going to be worse. Uh, I live in an area that is heavily uh, populated by restaurants and in talking to the restaurant owners, um, the ones I talk to are pretty pessimistic about their ability to um, continue to, to uh, operate after this. Uh, and so we think that properties that are uh, home to restaurants are gonna be dramatically impacted uh, by COVID both short-term and long-term in real estate values. Uh, can we move to the next slide? And this just gives you some more detail um, about lost sales. Um, it goes into billions and billions of lost sales for, for restaurants, and that's consistent with what we're seeing for clients who have restaurants. Lynn, anything to add here? Uh, no, just as Kyle said, um, we're really seeing the restaurant industry hit hard. 
Um, I think a lot of people focus on, well, people, they can still do takeout and that's true for some businesses, but for other businesses, takeout is actually more expensive to do than to just simply temporary close, um, which is also leading, the longer this goes on, will lead to more permanent closures. And in the healthcare industry as well, we are also seeing a significant impact. Um, you may, it, it, you may be surprised, but the healthcare industry is actually one of the industries that has been hit hardest by this. Um, rural hospitals and private medical practices in particular are struggling, even health partners. Um, health partners has gone from 5,000 patient visits a day to 300 video and telecommuting visits per day, and that's it. As a result, clinics are closing, health partners has closed six to eight uh, clinics entirely. I think the biggest issue is that we don't know how long this COVID uh, pandemic is going to be impacting um, our economy, whether it will be something that's just a few more months. You know, you see some people predicting as long as a year to 18 months before we can really get back to business as, norm as usual. Some people say we'll never get back there. So um, it's really uncertain right now uh, as to what the overall impact will be in the market. So these other industries impacted, these are just some of the uh, industries that, that we have seen um, being impacted. And I'll touch on a, on a few of them. Uh, some of them I've been, I've been personally involved in. Uh, for the first time that I think anybody can remember, the major casinos in this area are shut down. Las Vegas is essentially uh, shut down and one thinks about the ripple effect that's going to have on all of the businesses that serve those casinos uh, in in both the area of the casinos and, and for sure in Las Vegas and places like <clears throat> New Jersey is going to have dramatic ripple effects on neighboring properties that serve the casino industry. Automakers, one of my uh, good friends from from law school is in the legal department at Ford and I was talking to him two or three days ago. I uh, think about this, Ford hasn't produced a car in more than three weeks off of any of its, any of its lines. It's effectively shut down um, automakers, which has the ripple effect of shutting down uh, dealers. Um, uh, convention center, I've spent a lot of time dealing with lease issues and defaults on areas that are um, geared towards conventions, and I think we all know that, that gyms are shut down. I was talking to a, a gym owner in the North Loop who is convinced this will end um, gyms as we know it because it's going to be a long time before people are comfortable um, uh, getting into a small room on, on 80 bikes and sweating within you know, three feet from each other. So uh, these industries were continuing to, to monitor, and the rest of them, I think, are self uh, self-explanatory. So what does this mean for the real estate market? As I previously mentioned, it's just a little too early to tell how big this impact will be. We don't know how long, um, we don't know how long this things will remain to be shut down. And when they come back, we don't know what it's going to look like. We also don't know what kind of financial relief will be on, offered from Congress. Um, but with all these closures, we're likely to see high vacancy, which in turn leads to lower markets. We're also going to see some um, impact from the credit ratings of tenants, tenants that were considered to be very low risk and good tenants um, are, have potential now to become higher risk tenants. So when people are evaluating whether to buy a building, we're going to see that um, people, buyers might be willing to pay less for properties um, as a result of the fact that the tenants that are operating in those buildings are um, higher risk tenants. Okay, and I will launch our polling question number two, which asks, uh, do you or your company own, lease, or manage commercial, industrial, or multifamily properties?
Okay. I'm going to close the poll. So it looks like we're at about a 55-45 split, which is um, interesting. I, I, I would not have expected as many no's as what we got there, but I will turn it back over to Lynn and Helen. And I think, Lynn, go ahead, Lynn. Go ahead. I think the big point here is what Lynn's going to talk to you next is what does this all mean for real estate um, tax? And uh, uh, we'll talk about how this impacts real estate taxes going forward. Go ahead. So there are two types of property. Um, there's real property and personal property. Uh, Generally, the, the definitions can vary between states, but generally, generally real property is property that is immovable. It includes structures that are integrated or fixed with the land um, ver ver versus personal property. The main characteristics of that are that it's movable or that you can remove it without causing damage to the real estate. So often we think of desks or cubicles are generally considered uh, personal property. So, some states tax personal property and a lot, and some states don't. Um, so you just have to be aware of what state you're in to know whether you're gonna be taxed on the personal property. The states that do tax personal property generally, generally focus on um, certain types of property and they also have exemption generally for um, the first, like certain amount of in value of personal property. Getting our polling questions in. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to polling question number three, which asks, do you anticipate an increase in vacancy at your commercial, industrial, and multifamily properties as a result of COVID-19? Shut down the polling. You can see that about half of those responding anticipate the increase in vacancies. So that's interesting. I'm surprised by the 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 no answers on there, and I'm only surprised for two reasons. Uh, maybe I'm only seeing the. The bad news is clients call me with tenants who aren't uh, paying rent or are asking for substantial rent reductions. And then I'm also concerned that the next round of rent payments um, are not until May, uh, you know, next week. So I think we're going to see uh, more pressure as tenants' businesses slow down. And I, I would love nothing more than to be wrong about that, but that's not what I'm seeing in the in the marketplace. Um, so I think the next slide, um, as we get into real estate valuation, the question always is, what is the fair market value of the property? There's uh, the appraisal of real estate, which is a book that a lot of appraisers use or most appraisers use has one definition. Uh, this various different states by statute or rule sometimes have slightly different or modified definition that it all comes down to um, how would the marketplace react. In preparation for our discussion today, um, I was curious what appraisers are doing right now with the COVID situation. So I reached out to three different appraisers who I, who I work with and know who do a fair amount of appraisal work in, in different sectors and for different uh, types of, of appraisals. And as far as I can tell, um, none of them, and understandably so, given how recent this is, none of them know how to value or factor in COVID. So to one degree or another, the appraisers I spoke with are putting a statement in their appraisal along the lines of COVID is too new. I'm not sure whether this is a short-term market blip 
or um, as a as a long term effect. So I'm just recognizing that COVID is there, and we don't necessarily know what that means to to value long term. And I and to be fair to appraisers, I really think that's all you can do right now. We can't point to a universe of data that anybody can rely on um, to to tell us how this is going to impact the marketplace, other than I think everyone agrees there is going to be an impact, or most people agree there is going to be an impact um, on it. On the next page, is that, Lynn, can you get to the next page? As I mentioned, different states, and these are just the Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, and Iowa uh, codes have slightly different uh, terms about what market value is, but again, they all essentially come back to the same base, which is it's, it's what would happen in the marketplace between a willing buyer uh, and a willing seller in an arm's length um, transaction. Um, so that's the foundation of the cornerstone for what most appraisers or what all appraisers should use in their appraisals. So the first step in the valuation process is determining a property's highest and best use. Um, which may or may not be the actual use for which the property is currently used for. Um, the highest and best use uh, based on the Appraisal Institute, which is the same book that Howard just used to define uh, fair market value, is the reasonable probable use of property that results in the highest value. Uh, you analyze four criteria, what's legally permissible, physically possible, and financially feasible. After you determine all of those three, you then test for what is the maximally productive use of the property. And to relate it back to COVID for one minute, I'll go back to one of my examples. It'll be interesting to see how that changes. Um, a, a property that is set up as a, as a group workout facility with the big rooms and the areas for the weights and the bikes uh, up until about 60 days ago or maybe 90 days ago, whenever we don't exactly know when the marketplace felt the impact of COVID, but prior to COVID, um, highest and best use may have been for a workout facility, and that may have dramatically changed as a result of, of COVID. So that's one thing you're going to have to look at when investing in real estate or appraising properties is has COVID impacted what would otherwise be the highest and best use uh, to one degree or another. And another area that this will really impact, again, is the medical practice uh, pro type properties. Those properties generally are a little bit more specific and built out for the specific needs of running medical practice and running technical equipment and health equipment. And um, if those practices are shut down and not reopening, then how are we going to convert those to a different type of use? So that's another area that could be significantly impacted. Appraisers generally look at, and states generally require assessors to look at three approaches to value, the sales comparison approach, uh, cost approach, and the income approach. I would say um, the most common approach that we see uh, for basic properties is the sales comparison approach. The sales comparison approach is where you uh, compare the subject property to sales of similar properties in competing areas. You then adjust those properties, uh, the comparable properties for things like location, property characteristics, the condition of the property, zoning, and the actual uses of the property uh, so that you can, the goal is to try and get the, make those comparable properties as similar to the property that you're value, valuing. And just real quick before I get into the cost approach, the, the concept in the sales comparison approach is if you're buying a single family home in a neighborhood and there were 10 sales of single family homes in the neighborhood that sold for a, a, a tight price range, there's a pretty good indication of what the value of the property is that you're, you're looking to, to purchase. The, the question with COVID, of course, is if all of those sales were six months ago and you're buying the house now, how do you adjust those sales or consider those sales in light of of COVID. And again, that's what appraisers and valuation experts are going to wrestle with as we get into this new COVID economy. Um, another approach to, to value that appraisers use is the cost approach. 
um, it, it, the cost approach essentially is this, what would it cost to replace what you're buying? And then how is it depreciated in a variety of different, different ways? And I think we have an example of how this works on the next slides, Lynn. So first you start out with what would it cost to replace the actual uh, building? And, and this is actually pulled from an actual appraisal and, and you go through um, estimates for uh, you know, heating and cooling and, and, and dock heights and, and other factors that go into the cost to, to build a building that is similar to the building you are valuing and you reach a, a number, and in this case it might be hard to read, but the number was $6,550,000 to replace it. Um, then that's the first step is what would it cost to rebuild it? And the next slide um, is how is it depreciated? If it's, if it's 20 years old, it's clearly not worth uh, the same as a brand new building. So appraisers look at, has there been physical depreciation? Is it functionally obsolete? Are there things about the buildings that you, that, that make it, uh, less relevant in the marketplace. For example, if all of the new um, uh, warehouse buildings are have 22 foot clear heights and the, the building you're looking at is 16 feet or 18 feet, you're gonna have to add some sort of adjustment to, to that because of the lower clearing heights relative to the marketplace. When you then take out the depreciation relative to the cost, uh, then you get to a value of the property based on the cost approach. So you can see in this particular circumstance, um, after the reduction for depreciation and obsolescence, the property was worth roughly 65% of what it would have been to, to build it new um, in there. So that's how the, the cost approach is. To get back to my single family home example, uh, if all the homes were built in the 1980s, what would it cost to rebuild that home? And then how would you depreciate it in the marketplace relative to what a new home would cost to be built? That's the, that's the cost approach. Appraisers generally rely on the cost approach for newer buildings. They generally tend to be a, tend to be a more accurate approach as it applies to you know buildings that were built in the last five, maybe 10 years. When you get outside that period, period of time, the depreciation just gets really hard to estimate. Um, and so because of that, appraisers generally um, do not default to the cost approach unless it's a newer building. And finally, we have the income approach. And the income approach is a very commonly used method as it applies to properties that are income producing. Um, it's, uh, there are multiple types of income approaches. The most common that we see is a direct capitalization method where you look at the net operating income of a property and you divide it by a cap rate. A cap rate is just a measure of how much risk is associated with the building. And when you do that, you come to a value, um, a market value for the property. So this is um, just an example of what we see as a basic direct cap um, income approach. There are several ways to run a direct cap income approach. So this is not the only way but as you can see, you generally have all your rental income, any expenses you recover, such as um, utilities, insurance, property taxes. You apply a market rate vacancy and credit loss. And that's an important thing to um, emphasize that for all the approaches we look at, what is the market rate? We don't look at actual lease terms of a building. So if a building is 100% occupied, but market rent or market vacancy is actually at like 90 or 10 percent vacancy we would apply that market rate vacancy here it was determined that market vacancy for this building was six percent um and then you subtract all the expenses and then you get to your net operating income um, you do also apply a market rate for repairs and maintenance and for management fees um, and reserves for replacement so again, how would this um, apply in, in, our, in our COVID world now? If you're looking at an office building today and we're looking at the same exact office building a year ago, uh, 
uh, and you knew what the rental income was a year ago as a result of the tenants in place, uh, that assumed rental income, this particular example is uh, $324,000 in assumed rental income. Well, in the COVID world, if you know that of the tenants in the building, 20% of them are going to go bankrupt and another 20% are going to need substantial rent reductions to survive this. And that's what you're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, that top line rental income is going to have to be adjusted. And you'll also see here towards the bottom that there's a capitalization rate of seven and a half percent. The capitalization rate is, is basically just a risk factor. Um, and the question is, is because of COVID, has buying this type of real estate become more risky as an investment vehicle? And are you going to adjust that, that rate? Uh, if this building is a retail center with coffee shops and nail salons um, and restaurants, uh, it certainly as a result of COVID has become a much riskier investment than it was a year ago. Uh, and different segments of the marketplace will have different, different risks. Uh, it, it may be, and we don't know, it may be that, for example, in the heavy industrial market, uh, COVID doesn't have as dramatic of an effect either on rents or capitalization rates. O only time is going to tell. The point is, it, it is going to change how, how an appraiser looks at the income approach as a result of these additional risks and tenant defaults. Ideally, all three approaches should support each other and come to a similar um, valuation. So the income approach should be the same as the cost approach, which should be the same as the sales comparison approach. There are also some less common methods of valuation that we won't get into here. They're generally used for more specialized types of property. Um, uh, it should also be mentioned that some states do require a specific valuation method to be used before others. Wisconsin follows something called the Markarian hierarchy, which requires you first to look at sales of the property itself. Then second, you go to the sales comparison approach and look at comparable sales. And then third, um, only if there is no recent sale of the subject property or there are no comparable sales, then you may are permitted to look at the income approach or cost approach. We just wanted to talk briefly like about appraisal licensing and standards. Um, like most other professions, uh, certainly professions we deal with on a daily basis, there are of course standards for um, appraisers and the standards are loosely divided into two categories. Um, legal requirements by either state or federal statutes or regulations and then um, the industry also has established um, requirements for itself to, to follow both in terms of how to evaluate an appraisal assignment and then reporting on an appraisal assignment. Um, it's, it's uh, the, what I can tell, the takeaway from this is the most important part in evaluating an appraiser for any particular project uh, is just to inquire and make sure that the appraiser has the knowledge, experience, background to do this, uh, to do whatever it is that, that the appraisers uh, attempt to do in, in the marketplace. Um, you, you may not want to, for example, have a residential appraiser or somebody who does residential appraising uh, look at, at commercial properties and depending on the particular state and regulations, depending on the type of license that appraiser has, he or she may have to have a different license to do um, a different type of appraisals. So just something to, to be aware of. Um, there's not, we don't have the time and there's really no reason to, to go into the details on that in this type of um, seminar. I also think it's really important to know your market. In Minnesota, when you do a property tax appeal, for instance, the appraiser's appraisal is their direct testimony and you get um, 
they don't get a chance to do a direct testimony at court, meaning they don't get a chance to explain their appraisal. The appraisal speaks for itself. So because of that, um, you really have to be careful in Minnesota about the appraiser that you select when you go to trial, whereas other states, you know, the, the written work of the appraisal is less important and you have a lot more of a chance to explain, um, explain your case a bit. So factors to consider when deciding whether you might have a good appeal. Um, first, um, things that impact value, location, zoning, vacancy, conditions of property, rent rates, and financing. You notice that the biggest factor that's not on here um, and the newest factor is just COVID-19 itself. As Howard mentioned, um, it's still too early to tell, but this will likely COVID-19 will likely have a significant role in what types of properties are going to continue to be viable um, and, and what types of properties are going to have to have a converted use and what that is going to do and how that's going to impact property values. Obviously, COVID-19 is going to have a significant impact on vacancy, um, rental rates, and financing. So one thing that we always evaluate with uh, clients is whether or not, if you're going to protest taxes for your property, it makes, it makes economic sense to, to do so. Um, and I just got to note that some people raised hands. So let me finish this and then maybe we can go to that. Kyle, I don't know exactly how to do that, but let me finish this and we'll go to the questions. Um, real estate taxes in, in the states we mentioned and certainly in Minnesota are a function of the value of the, of the property. And inevitably, um, when a client comes to us, uh, the, most clients say, my taxes are too high. And the question is, when we go through the time, expense, and effort of a tax appeal process, when you look at the cost for attorneys, appraisers, and, and don't discount the, the time of the actual client who's going to have to pay attention to this, does it make sense economically to file a tax protest? Um, uh, just as one example, um, depending on your, your tax rate, uh, in Minnesota, they range from 1.5 to 4%. And I'd say that's generally consistent in the states we work in. Uh, if you're only going to get a $100,000 reduction, uh, you're only going to save $1,500 to $4,000. And by the time you get done paying appraisers and other experts and the time involved, it may or may not be worth the effort. So I think it's important early on to work with the valuation consultants, the attorneys, and, and, and the client to make sure that the protests make economic sense. Um, I have no idea how to check who raised their hands, Kyle. Yeah, so no, thanks for pointing that out, Howard. Um, just as an FYI to those on the webcast, if you do have questions to use the chat function, um, just submit them there um, and then we will, to the extent possible, incorporate those within our discussion here. Um, so that is all we have at this point. So am I supposed to do anything to these in response to these questions, Kyle? Nope. Okay. Great. All right. So we will move on to our fourth polling question. Um, so our fourth polling question asks um, whether you have filed a property tax appeal before. And I will be shutting down the polling. We have a 70 30 split on um, those that have not versus out. I'll turn it back over to Howard and Lynn. All right. The appeals process across the Midwest, um, they can vary from state to state. And right now we are seeing some changes. Um, and some modifications to that process as a result of COVID. Generally, those changes are applicable to this year only. 
um, you have up right now a, a cartoon my in-laws actually sent to me from Duluth. Um, I just wanted to tell you folks that you look like a million bucks and <laughs> what a nice man. Actually, not really. That guy assesses our property tax. So I think it's cute. As Howard mentioned, the most common reasons for appeal are estimated market value. There's something called unequal assessment, meaning your property was assessed significantly higher than uh, similar properties classification. Your property is actually um, and then, you know, it should be a residential and they assessed it at commercial. Um, and then exemption status. Note that taxes, my taxes are too high, is not a basis for appeal. Are you doing this? All right. You? So, yes, yeah, sorry, my kids just tried to bang down the door. <laughs> um, so common reasons for appeal, um, oh, just skip that. So in Minnesota, the assessment date, uh, in a normal world without COVID-19, uh, the assessment date is January 2nd and the taxes are payable the following year. The petitions are due on April 30th of the year that the taxes are payable. So for example, um, right now we're dealing with the January 2nd, 2019 assessment date. And that means that th those are the taxes that are payable in 2020. Um, and you file the appeal uh, with the Minnesota tax court. And then from there you have an automatic right to have an appeal at the Minnesota Supreme Court. Um, Lynn, are you gonna talk about, oh, okay. You can talk about how COVID's changed that. Are we gonna get to that in Minnesota yeah, on the April 3rd? Okay, never mind. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, in Minnesota, we also have something called the August 1st rule, which uh, is a mandatory disclosure deadline for income producing properties to provide financial statements uh, to counties. If you don't provide this information by August 1st, your case is likely to result in an automatic dismissal. Um, as I mentioned before, in Minnesota, when you go to tax court, your appraisals serve as the expert's direct testimony. So something to consider when you're filing an appeal is that um, appraisers can be a bit more expensive in Minnesota because they have to write a more in-depth and thorough appraisal. And finally, um, this is really important this year, especially payment of taxes. Um, taxes have to be paid if you have an appeal pending. If you don't timely pay your taxes, your case is subject to dismissal. So, Getting to how, how have these things changed as a result of COVID? Uh, the appeal deadline for this year only has been extended. So from April 30th to May 30th. May 30th is a Saturday, so just a heads up. Um, better do your filing and service before then. Um, the deadline to pay taxes, there has not been a legislative amendment to postpone the first half payment of taxes, which is May 15th. Um, some counties are waiving their right to, co to collect interest and penalties on late payment of taxes um, if they are paid by July 15th is a common one. Um, however, this is not a, an extension of the deadline itself to pay taxes. And so that provision before that I talked about relating to uh, payment of taxes when you have an appeal pending um, hasn't been modified. So that May 15th deadline has to be met if you are planning on appealing your taxes. It gets a little bit more confusing this year because normally the deadline to file your petition comes before the deadline to pay. Um, and this year, that is not the case. If I could just go back and cover a couple of things. I want to stress the August 1 rule in Minnesota and a conversation I always have early on with my clients is in order to proceed with our protest here, we have to, and there's no option, provide a lot of information to the assessor on August 1. If you don't provide it, your case is going to get dismissed. And, and conversations I have routinely, and of course, uh, one of them I had this morning is, 
I need to know what your information is going to say before we decide to file because it could end up hurting as well. Um, if, if you look at the information you have to provide to the assessor and that information would clearly demonstrate that the property is undervalued for tax purposes, um, we want to think very carefully about whether or not we file a protest and shoot ourselves in the foot um, with that. And that, that nuance and that point is not lost at all on, on assessors. So we gotta, you got to think through that before you file a tax protest, because if the answer is, I don't want to give the information to the assessor because it will hurt me, then there's no reason to file the tax protest. You're just wasting time and money on it. One more point that I get asked a lot, and the reason I'm thinking about it is I got asked this morning, you have to file every year in Minnesota. You don't uh, preserve later years. So if you're going to protest for 2020 and it's not done, you still have to file again in 2021 and 2022. It, it, every year is a new tax protest. So, Lynn? All right. Let's move on to Wisconsin quickly. This is uh, our, our analogy to the Wisconsin property tax appeal process. It, it's a little bit chaotic a lar in large part because um, you have to go through a local board of review process and every board of review kind of has their own rules and their own timing and their own provisions. So the assessment date in Wisconsin is January 1st. There is an open book opportunity where you can go chat with your local assessor. And then after that, every, uh, every municipality holds what's called a board of review or a, a board of assessors, depending on whether it's a first class or second class city. Um, it is possible to, you have to appeal, appeal and appear at the board of review. If you do not physically appear at the local board of review, then um, you will not be able to file an appeal from there to circuit court. Um, again, in Wisconsin, you also have to pay your taxes. Taxes are generally due by January 31st. Um, it is possible to pay second half taxes on or before July 31st, 2020. But filing, timely paying your taxes is a requirement, again, for filing an appeal. So what has been the impact as a result of, of COVID? Oh, um, again, as Ho Howard, similar to Minnesota, you have to provide income and expense information prior to appearing at the Board of Review. Um, and again, this is only for non-manufacturing properties. Manufacturing properties has a different process um, that you have to go through. Lynn, I think um, we can touch briefly on the rest of the states. I and mean, I think the takeaway from the, the rest of the states is um, everybody's got a different process. I know we still have one more poll to get to as well on this. So you want to summarize this or yeah so the COVID changes in Wisconsin are just uh, the, the Department of Revenue has issued a position that COVID-19 does not impact the value or classification determinations for 2020. Um, as of yet there has not been an, a, any extensions to the appeal or payment deadlines and the Board of Reviews are still um, scheduled to take place in Wisconsin between April 27th and June 10th however um, individual municipalities have the right to extend those dates. So make sure that you look for individual municip municipalities. Um, and in the interest of time, um, we will jump to the last polling question, as Howard mentioned. If you have, um, oh, I can't go back. I went one too far. <laughs> so summary of the appeal process, Howard. Yeah, so the, the um, I think the takeaway from all of this is uh, make sure that wherever you are in terms of state or local government, you understand what the appeal process is. Um, make sure you work closely with your consultants and lawyers to understand what the, the deadlines are. And I can 
tell you that those deadlines in many circumstances um, are, are punitive and missing them can be fatal to the appeal. Uh, whether you have a meritorious appeal or not, you might just get kicked out on a procedural ground. I think we'll see some leniency like we have in Minnesota because of uh, COVID, but uh, better safe than sorry if there's un uncertainty. And then uh, sort of the, the tongue in cheek joke we put in here is if all else fails, make sure you hire us so we can help guide you, help guide you <laughs> through the process. <laughs> Um, I think there's one more poll and then Kyle, are we supposed to leave time for questions? I'm not clear on that. Um, I, I don't think we need to leave any time for questions. We have not had anything to come in, um, but I do want to um, again, remind our audience that um, that these slides, um, you know, understanding that we kind of quickly went through um, over Iowa and Nebraska, um, that these slides are available on both the Fredrickson website as well as um, on the Minnesota CPA website. So, um, they're accessible and, and, you know, by all means, if you have questions on them, feel free to reach back up, up, back out to us um, and, and raise those questions at a point in the future. Um, if I move on to polling question number five here, um, I will launch that. Um, question five asks, if available, uh, do you plan to take advantage of opportunities to extend the deadline to pay property taxes or abate penalty and interest on late payment of property taxes? Okay, I'm going to end our poll. And again, it looks like we have a, a mixed bag of, of results here, um, you know, between companies and individuals that are looking to, um, you know, extend or, you know, hope to abate penalty and interest on, um, based on late payments. Stop sharing results. So, this is typically the point in time. Lynn, Lynn and I have done similar presentations together probably half dozen, dozen times now. We typically leave room at the end for questions, which is why we have a few extra minutes here. It sounds like we're not doing that, but I'll just tell you um, in the last three weeks, uh, as I mentioned, I got a broad real estate practice. I do a lot of landlord tenant work. Our group here does a lot of landlord tenant work. I am now personally involved in more than 50 different um, non-payments of rent or tenant defaults um, as of April. And as far as we can tell with the clients I represent, that number is only gonna grow as of, as of May. Um, um, my property owner clients are doing what they can to both understand the situation, but also recognize that that just because tenants aren't paying doesn't mean their costs go away. They still have to generally pay taxes. They still have to pay their mortgages. Um, sometimes they've got uh, other obligations to pay for the properties as well. So um, at least anecdotally, if not statistically, it's hard for me to imagine that this COVID situation isn't going to have a dramatic effect on at least certain segments of of real estate and uh, I, I again i i would love nothing more than to be wrong about that but based on what i'm seeing i think it's pretty self-evident that this is going to have a dramatic effect on real estate values lynn are you seeing anything else no um, now, one other thing to, to point out to um, our attendees here, um, you all should have received um, within the chat dialog um, a link um, on the Fredrickson webpage to the slides that our, um, our presenters were working through today. So um, that should be in the chat dialog. Um, so to the extent that you are looking for those, um, that's a quick and easy way to, to get to them, obviously. So check the chat function um, before you leave. And Howard, Lynn, unless you had anything else, I, I can conclude. I think that's all we have. We uh, Perfect. wish everybody well and stay healthy. Yeah, as our time drives to a close, um, I would just like to, um, again, remind everyone um, of our return for the next session, um, which will take place at the same time and place next week. 
uh, during that session, which will be led by Masha Yevzelman and yours truly. We will focus on tax controversy strategies from onset through litigation. Um, thank you again to our panelists today and to all of our attendees for joining. Uh, have a great remainder of the week, and we will talk with you again next Thursday. Thank you, everyone.